thank you for sticking around. And I know this is the last session and probably most of people went to a developer session more. Yeah, and then probably when people read the bio, designer, heh, whatever, right? <laughs> so I understand this is a developer's uh, conference. Uh, but thank you so much for coming. And uh, I'm going to talk about the creating the uh, accessible and the inclusive digital product and why this is important. So for example, uh, if the content doesn't speak to your user, or if your user cannot access the content or complete the task, there's no meaning for them to interact with your product. So that's why it's very important that you have to give them the, uh, the access to your content. And I want to talk about a little bit myself. So I'm a product designer. I work at Google. And, uh, and I'm an accessibility evangelist. I'm a music lover and a freelance translator. I primarily work for like, some of, uh, yeah, some of like, uh, uh, animation conventions. I don't know if any of you go to those conventions. Thank you. So block here. Yeah. And then, there and yes. OK, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, so um, the freelance translator, right? So I usually go to those like uh, geeks conventions and help translating for <laughs> the conventions, uh, especially when they are guests, they come in from overseas, right? They perform uh, or band of music guests, they perform here, I will help them to translate. And I'm a proud, um, proud Taiwanese American, but truly Japanese are hard. My parents always wonder why, you know? <laughs> so, Okay, and the next one I want to talk about how I get started with my accessibility journey. So it was about like seven, eight years ago, and I was working hard on my product for about six months. And in the end of the development cycle, I handed it over to our QA engineer, Irene. And she immediately filed a bug against me to say, your product is not accessible. And I was like, uh, Irene, can you elaborate a little bit more. And she said, she turned something called talk back on. And I was like, uh, what is that? You know? <laughs> that was like the first time in my life I got experienced to that kind of uh, challenge. You know? And this is how my product sounds like to visually impaired user, and which is shocking. You know? So and in order to not let any of you repeat that journey, that I want to talk about like what we can do to prevent that kind of situation happening. And so first of all, I want to talk about the introduction to accessibility. And I know like Charlene has covered it very well like in the previous session, but I just want to uh, like touch on certain points. And the next one will be talking about the uh, examples of assistive technology and the importance of all land and area label. And also the product inclusion mindset. That's just more for like your inspiration and probably throughout your like daily job, you don't think much about on that side, but gradually when we have more data, when we have more uh, like connectivity to other products, APIs want to keep that in mind that what can potentially impact your product and the machine learning fairness. And that was actually the product I was working on currently, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And OK, so why digital accessibility and inclusion? And because this is the right thing to do. And of course, say, who doesn't want to serve, like be a good citizen to other users, right? And another thing is that it's better product for everyone. So a lot of time, the features that you implement, such as like a screen reader, that was initially served as for like blind community. But eventually, nowadays, every time you use Google Maps or you use any like a assistant, you are actually leveraging that technology without like think twice, right? But those are initially was actually be designed or focused or targeted to a certain demographic. But it actually benefits everybody. And the next one I'll talk about is a legal requirement. There are a lot of laws, such as like ADA, like American Disability uh, Association, and especially focusing on Title III and Section 508. And it kind of depends on which product line you are on. And there are different regulations as well. So for example, if your product heavily have like a, have a media, like uh, videos, audios, or something, then Section 504 might be your uh, challenges or your guideline as well, you know? So it kind of depends. Do you want to guess how many digital product lawsuit was actually filed last year? 
2018, just within one year, how many? Just roughly guess. 20,000. 20, Any other numbers? <laughs> OK. So according to the level access, it's actually, uh, it's actually very, very close, 22,000 over. And it was actually 177 percentage increase compared to 2017. So which means it's kind of like everywhere now. So it's a matter of time, not like a, it's not applicable to you. So just think in that sense. And do you know who was the first digital product case actually went on trail? No. It was actually a store, a big name here in, uh, in Florida, Windexy. That was the first trail that it, a, a lot of like uh, Target, any other companies like Walmart, them, them knows that they all got sued in the past, right? But look, actually went on trail is a Windexy and they actually got ruled and they have to comply within two years. And imagine how much money they have to spend and go into that. And the reason they got sued is that there's a user living in Florida and he wants to look up the physical store information. And their website is, like he's not using the, uh, the like uh, online shopping in that sense, right? But he wants to know where is the closest store near, near me. And because he cannot access that information. So the judge thinks that your physical and your digital product are closely tied to each other. So you have to comply. So that's why they got ruled and they have to take the actions. Yeah. And then the next one is like talking about business opportunities. So actually in America, there are 62 million people with certain kinds of disabilities. So imagine 62 million people in the United States, right? So if you don't make your product accessible, not only you're missing out with those audience, but also there's a chance that they will refuse or their family will refuse to involve with your product. And here's a quick like diagram that was made by IBM a couple years ago. And they are talking about like, uh, if you incorporate an accessibility like a flow or thinking process into your development life cycle. So initially you paid one X, just like you pay your da daily salary, right? But if you towards the end, like even there's a lawsuit involved, there's actually 30 X plus that you have to pay for remedy and or to mitigate like what you missed out. So there being a saying like for the past two, three years, they keep saying that we should have the mindset of shift left. So before 1999, uh, before ADA law and WCAG, everyone was like, a, like in the free land, wild west, you know, so nobody was paying attention. But uh, starting that time, there's a spike that everybody have to get on board. But for most of us, we actually didn't catch up until recent years, right? So let's visualize it. What does 30X mean to the product or to the company? but pretty much it looks like this, you know? So if the product is not accessible, and in the end, you spend 30X, but still, is this accessible to your users? Probably not, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, so this is actually happening in the real world, right? So imagine this is probably happened in the digital product a lot as well. People just use override, override, over override, because they won't be able to touch their 20 years old system, right? So uh, next one is that uh, I call it more like the special needs instead of accessibility because a lot of time that uh, people, they just prefer to do things in certain ways. Just like all of us, we have different settings for our desktop or different settings for our keyboard shortcut or something, right? So we call this like a special needs. And a lot of time in the design product design world and we have a design background, right? So we usually refer the user. Uh, we Usually, before the research or something, we will tend to ask, how do you prefer to be identified? You know, so they will say, oh, it's fine, you can call me blind, you know? <laughs> or sometimes people with more sensitive, they will say, um, low vision, I'm not fully blind, or something, right? So be aware of the terminology that you use when you interact with your user or when you have a chance to get involved with them, you know? So, and they are like, um, 
motor disabilities, hearing, cognitive, vision, and aging. And aging population is growing like uh, super, super fast. According to the level access report, in less than 11 years, 20% of Americans will be over age of 65. That's actually a big number that you have to start thinking now, right? Which means how they interact with your digital product is very, very different, right? So now you're thinking about like the, the kids, they can use Snapchat, they can do this and that, they can do their own YouTube search. But imagine 10 years later, all the seniors that get on smartphone or any kind of digital product how are you going to react to that kind of situation? So I'm going to quick, uh, quickly touch on a couple of the examples of assistive technology. So for people with mobility uh, impairments, these are the assistive technology that's out there they can leverage. So for example, uh, voice input. Have anyone seen the demo or the example of it? So uh, it was, uh, if you, you want to try it, if you have the Android phone, you can download something called voice access. And if you don't, uh, I think for the newer phone, like Pixel 2 and Plus, it's a, a building feature. So basically, it's under your general accessibility settings. And after you turn it on, what it does is that you see there are little bubbles comes up. So how the uh, motor impaired the user, if they can control their voice, they will just say, open number one, and that app will pop and they can execute, they can type in Gmail, and they can say, delete last word or something, or use their voice input. And it's pretty similar to uh, uh, Assistant, and they can use it in Docs and, and any kind of um, content creation as well. And the next one is like a, a switch access. So switch access basically just have two huge buttons. So if the user, they have like, a, they don't have like fingers they can easily control, right? They can actually use elbow or anywhere to touch on those two buttons. So white is usually like move. It's like similar to the tap key. They can just move, move, move to the content they want and they enter it to select, right? And then they're uh, like a sip and puff, you know? So the user can actually, the one that download was actually they can uh, use their mouse cursor, control their mouse cursor, and execute an action as well. And the one that's on the top that was, uh, is called Dasher. Dasher was actually the eye gaze tracking tool. So uh, can, that, that person was wearing uh, some kind of like detection device. And when his eye gaze was moving, he's actually typing, uh, typing like a, doing the regular typing on his own. And they will have the screen reader to read it back to say, my name is so-and-so. So loads of technology all exist, and um, feel free to like Google search them, and you will find a lot of examples. And the next one is like viewing in, uh, impairment, and the assistive technology they will use will lead like something like captions, and hearing aids or uh, cochlear implement. So captions, there are two type of captions. One is called open caption, one is called closed caption. Anyone know the differences? I think one is One is, one is like describing speech, the other one is describing... That, that's uh, the voice uh, description. That's right. right. So recently, there's uh, some of the movie, if you take plan or something, or like if you look at like a Netflix or something, sometimes you will see the voice description. So basically, that will describe something that's not in the script such as the background, the music, or the, uh, the situation, the interaction that's happening. That's voice interaction, uh, so uh, description. So voice, uh, the example will be, uh, men walk slowly in, uh, by the beach or something, you know, or lights gradually turn down. That, that's not in the actual script, but uh, the voice description will serve as that. And the difference between closed caption and open caption, closed captions usually, like if you see, like watch YouTube video, there's a CC button. That's actually dynamic, and you can actually turn it on and off. That, that's called closed caption, and it can be localized easily by through different kind of technology, right? If you're in different region, they can actually localize and do the live caption in a different language. And open caption means something that's burned into the video that cannot be easily manipulated unless the, the, uh, the, the cinema company, they actually change that. And that's a hard-coded kind of concept. 
Okay, the next one is a cognitive impairment. And cognitive impairment, a lot of time, it's not easy to identify because most of users, they don't have visible physical identicator that shows you they have certain challenges or dis uh, disorders. So that's usually got um, neg neglected the most, you know. So, uh, so for example, like a dyslexia or people have anxiety, panic disorder, those are all considered part of the cognitive uh, impairment. Right. So uh, the, some of the uh, examples that you see will potentially trigger that. So this is a very common like shopping site for hotels or even tickets or something, right? A lot of time you will see those texts to say, in high demand, you missed it, 20 seats left, those kind of thing, right? Those are actually not very dangerous word for people with anxiety and panic disorder because they literally cannot orient their brain what action to do to prevent that happen. So they will re literally freak out and then don't know how to interact or they will make the purchase they're not supposed to do, right? So those out of um, time bounding something is usually try to prevent. And, uh, and then we, don't, we, know, we do also know like uh, people, a lot of users, they have like impairment, um, like motor impairment, um, mobility disability, uh, challenges, right? So do you know what's the standard for them to actually respond to your interaction? So for example, if you have a pop-up, if you have a hover over, if you have an undo button or something, right? Do you know what's the standard time for that? Three seconds? Three seconds? The, uh, according to WCAG, it's actually 20 seconds minimum. So remember next time if you have any response to say undo or submit or allow user at least 20 seconds to dismiss or take the action. Otherwise, they won't be able to focus, move their tab or certain assistive technology to execute the action they want. And another example I want to show you, it was actually called Monzo. It's a bank, it's actually the financial uh, institute in UK. They recently introduced a very nice feature because they did a research and they found out that most of the unintentional or unauthorized purchase that usually happen after 10 p.m. Because a lot of time people at the night, they are stressed out or they are tired, they don't usually make conscious purchase. So this company, this institution was very nice. So in the, the next day, they will send you a message. They say, you spend 300 and, oh, like 308 like, pounds online last night after 10 p.m. Would you like to review the purchase? So they actually let you go back and they say, no, let, that wasn't me, right? I was too tired. I didn't make that uh, like a smart decision, right? So they can actually decline that transaction. So think about there, a lot of company was doing things that's very thoughtful and don't you want these features as well, right? Sometimes you just rush in and purchase a lot of things because it's free shipping, right? But all of a sudden it's like, eh, you know, actually I don't need that, right? And you really want to a way to actually roll things back, right? So that's actually not only for people with anxiety or panic disorder, it's actually a very nice uh, feature for everybody as well. And the next one is, uh, hmm, I don't know why this happened, okay. And the next one is the visual impairment. So in visual impairment, we talk about like the assistive technology they use, such as screen reader and braille. The braille is like less refreshable, which means it will erase automatically every time the user interacted or every time they read something. And, and then there are like a large font, and this is a Zoom feature that's on Android. So some of the user, they are actually seeing that. And select to speed and high contrast, and especially a lot of things that we want to make sure they work for colorblind users as well, right? So yeah, so the next one. So like next one will come to uh, touch on like a, a lot of things that will happen to a lot of digital product potentially was uh, unlabel or mislabel or confusing labeling. So I did a, a quick uh, like um, experiment yesterday and I was looking at our app and I just turned uh, our event proto and I turned the voice over on and this is what I noticed. So I don't know if it's loud enough, otherwise I can plug it to the audio. 
Let's see. Hope it's not too, too loud. Oh, it's actually super quiet. Okay, so uh, if you have the app, you can feel free to like follow along and see, listen to what happened. So I'm just going to do a quick testing on how the screen reader react to the event proto, right? I hope nobody works for Eventbrite right here. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so let's listen to it, okay? Special button, current page, third button. What does that mean? What button, right? If you're a visual impaired user, do you know? what to do, right? Current page, Thursday, July 25th. Current page, Friday, July 26th. Current page, Thursday, July 25th. What's happening? Current page, July 25th. Current page, July 26th. Current page, July 27th. Which date it is, can you tell? You can't, right? Current page, Saturday, July 27th. Showing filtered results. Clear, button. Showing filtered results. But if you look at the UI, there's actually no filter open or new, no clear button open. The, what happened is that they're actually reading something behind the screen. The screen reader was actually cannot tell. And it was not constructed correctly. So screen reader gets super confused. Right. So these are just like a, the example of the screen unlabeled voice of so this is the example of unlabel, mislabel, or confusing. See, one app tell you three. So, <laughs> all right. So the next one is that uh, the next people is uh, actually color contrast. This is actually the highest uh, filed bug on a lot of companies' product. You know, this it seems super easy. But because if the uh, accessibility concept is not from top down, and if you receive the mark or if you receive the design that's from the other end of the, the product team didn't, uh, aren't, aren't aware of accessibility, a lot of time this got miscommunicated or the, either there, there are two sides, right? Either people eyeball the color, didn't actually use the hex color that's specified, or people actually give you the hex color that without the correct contrast ratio or the good contrast ratio, right? So what would happen if the, uh, the product doesn't have a good contrast ratio? So this is a very common component you see in a lot of like an app store or food review or any kind of that kind of thing, right? So what happened? What's the biggest challenge? If you're colorblind, can you tell how many star it is? 4.2, <laughs> right? So, right, it pretty much says everything is five star, right? So this is like if the product doesn't have a good contrast ratio, this will happen. You know, good enough they have the 4.2. Otherwise, the user will think, oh, okay, probably 6,000 people think it's five star, right? So that will mislead your user immediately. And the next one, we're talking about the logical order, grouping, and focus. And uh, the organization of your uh, layout and uh, for the sighted user can be confusing for screen reader users. So a lot of times, so one example is like in Gmail or in any kind of Google products, there is a button that's floating somewhere on the screen, right? It's either at the button right, button center, or, uh, or like upper right. So that kind of uh, structure, initially, the people think, oh, it's so innovative, and nobody ever done that, right? And it's so cool, let's just everybody get on board and use material design. And soon enough, we realized that um, actually, how does a screen reader user focus to that component? Because it's not, it's, it, it's not persistent on the screen, right? So the challenge will be, OK, should I read your Gmail, your inbox first? Or should I focus on the compose first? So that kind of like a vi vi like a visual component, you think it's straightforward to sighted user, but actually for screen reader user, you have to make very hard decision to say, let's go through the inbox first, then let the user compose. What if they want to come here to compose first, right? So that creates some of the uh, challenges. And so you have to think of the how the organization will actually impact both sides of the user. And the next one is like uh, sometimes we focus on the component without giving the full context. So a lot of time we want to save clicks for users. A lot of time we, especially I saw this a lot happening in the checkout flow. So the first screen will be here's your summary. Uh, here's a summary of your order. You, you have like five 
uh, items in your shopping cart. And the next screen will be your credit card information or sometimes it will be like a street address, right? But a lot of time, if it was auto-focused on one particular field, and a lot of time you will say, okay, first step is that you have five items in your shopping cart. And the second one is address one. And you're like, what just happened, right? So you're just trying to go next, but your next was actually photo auto-focused on street address one already. So without, so for sighted user, oh, the box is highlighted, of course I know what to do, right? But for visually impaired user, it was like, a, wait, did I skip anything? Right, so sometimes is that a good suggestion or are we saving the click for the good purpose or not, right? So those are the things that we don't say yes or no, but you have to constantly testing with your users and observe how they actually interact with your product. If if you look at the analytics, if you actually talk to your user, you will find the answer pretty easily. And the next one is that uh, a lot of times like, uh, people fo forget to put the visual focus, keyboard focus. You know, so for example, the visual highlight of the boxes, sometimes you, you, you just want to use your keyboard and you just tap, tap, tap. But a lot of times without that kind of visual indicator, you get lost. And also for mobility challenged users, they won't be able to know where their mouse cursor is right now, right? So if you receive the spec from your designer without the, the focus state, go back and ask for it and make sure it works for your color scheme of your product. Don't just pick a random color, right? Sometimes if you have dark background and white background, then what's the middle ground for your visual focus. So you just have to keep constantly like calling those things out. And, uh, and a lot of times, like if uh, some people, they, uh, they have the web pro product, right? And they will usually, they tend to forget the focus indicator or the reachable size. So for example, uh, the actual the touchable area, it has to be, anybody know the recommended size for no, okay, so it's usually like uh, Apple says 44, Google says 48, so I'll go with the bigger one. <laughs> so, right, so anything that you have to make sure, but this doesn't apply to the link that within the article. It's more talking about like the buttons or the actions that the interact, the user have to interact with it, or confirm, selector or something, you know, radio button, all those. And the next one will be the, um, and reachable hovers, uh, so we're touch on this as well. So basically the hover or the pop-up, the tool tips, that's usually very not accessible to most of the users, not only for keyboard user, but for uh, visual impaired user. The example we just heard, that was actually reading something behind the scene. And a lot of product I, I noticed is that once your hamburger menu, your site menu opened, it will not focus on the site menu immediately. It actually go through the content behind the hamburger menu, and then come to the front. That was usually the, uh, the, the uh, we didn't do the right thing or didn't focus in the right components. And there's an example of uh, the IBM site they redesigned. So before, it requires 30 plus tabs to go through their entire content because they didn't consider the visual component or the grouping or the reading logic. And after they fix it, everything can actually fit in nicely under 15 tabs. And the next one is like uh, the components. A lot of time, like people just look at uh, what uh, designer delivered to them and didn't think much which component is supposed to be used. Uh, so one example is that, so if designer give you, hand you over, okay, we want to build a table and this table need to be adjustable. So as a developer, how would you build it immediately, right? If you didn't think twice about how can I make this accessible, drag and drop is usually one of the biggest challenges for screen reader users as well, or people with mobility challenges as well, because it's very hard for them to focus on one thing, move it, move it to the, where, the place they want, right? So uh, there's a very good article that Salesforce write. So imagine if you have to build this component, what kind of existing components that's already accessible you can actually leverage? Can you guess? Something that's movable and it's already the existing native component for a lot of operating systems. 
This one is a little bit tricky. Okay, the answer is slider. Slider. So when you adjust volume, when you adjust brightness or something, right? Those are all native components to a lot of operating system. So you literally just restyle it to make it look like a table. But actually, it's a slider components, right? So as a developer, so you have to, and then to know how to do that, uh, there's a link to the Medium article, and uh, it was from two of very talented uh, developers from Salesforce. And yeah, so these are the scenarios that if you look at the mark, didn't think too much, and then you just implement it. Most of the time, it won't be accessible. And another example is that, I don't know if you notice that Google Maps, they are floor plans you can switch if the area is being serviced. So for example, department store, airport, sometimes you can actually switch between floors. Have you seen that interaction? No, not much, okay. So probably um, next time if you go to airport, most of the airport, they, you will able to switch your floor plan actually on Google Maps. So initially, when uh, my team member was implementing that, so we use link, actually. So we use link to say floor one, floor two, link, right? But as a screen reader user, what does it mean to link to two, link to one, right? And then they actually don't know which floor plan they are hearing right now. So we end up, feel, uh, we end up make the decision, radio button actually makes more sense. They will say floor one, select it floor two and selected so they know which floor plan they are actually currently navigating so but on, on the ui it's just the number but who knows behind the scene it has to be considered based on the components that's needed and a lot of times like uh don't override or don't create your shortcut a lot of time people will think oh okay i'm going to have uh the special take over certain letters on the keyboard or certain gestures on the app or something so that uh, the user can quickly swipe left and delete things and swipe right and do things and swipe up and do this you know but uh probably have to test all of those gestures with the existing screen reader gestures right so for example when user flip the pages move up move down they already have defined gestures within the apps. So when you try to design your own pattern, make sure it doesn't conflict with the existing and the patterns that screen readers are, re users are very, very familiar with. You don't want to like conflict with their natural behavior. And a couple of things I will just quickly go through why it is important to put the old tag and because the screen reader user will rely on it, otherwise they don't even know what image is about, why it's there, and is it important to them or not. So another thing is that it's good for SEO. And here's a quick example. So most of the, uh, so currently like Chrome and like uh, Google search is the, uh, the browser that will list your old tag uh, search result. So it's not nothing that, it's not something that's not visible to everybody, it's actually you. So if you put something silly, blah, 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 image, that blah, 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 is actually there, you know? So be aware of naming convention. And another one is that uh, a lot of people don't know how to make good old tags. So they will say, image of a baseball on the green field, a boy playing in the background, I mean, <laughs> Skip that. So you just say keywords, right? Baseball, green field, or something that's important that need to be described to your user. Otherwise, don't make a sentence and don't say something that's redundant because image already being included in the image label. So don't repeat those kind of thing. And be concise, right? And understand your user needs. Depends on what product you are working on right now. So the needs or the description to your image might be varied, you know? So for example, if I design a product for visual impaired user, if I pan my camera to this room, what the user would like to know will be, what is this? What is going on, right? So you will say conference, uh, like, uh, and, and, or something that's precise or that's uh, specific, specific to your users. So, and a lot of time I hear a lot of the, the, the visual impaired user will ask, is the light on or not? Right, so if you don't have those kind of concept or if you don't focus on what your product and want to communicate with your user, your user eventually have to ask someone else or because you, the, the product is not serving their needs, right? Or if you, 
you have the, like an OCR like app, and they can read the product name, look up the QR code, all those kind of thing, right? But you didn't tell them the expiration date, what flavor it is, what kind of drink it is. They might not be useful for your users as well, right? So just think about like what your user truly need for that product. And the lane attribute, uh, why is it important? Because once again, screen reader will rely on it to switch the modality and switch the language. If we don't use that, here's the example. So a screen reader, this is a page written in English. For the second paragraph, it will say South Pole C course, because if we didn't put that French tag in it, the screen reader will think it's English. And we'll just pronounce it in the regular English form, right? Um, so we just want to make sure we are not creating those confusion to the user, because all of a sudden, the user probably will think the screen is broken or something, is start reading something that they don't understand, right? And uh, this is another example, the multimodality translator. Uh, nowadays, we start seeing more and more um, technology company that integrate because it's very expensive to, hi uh, to hire sign language for a lot of scenario or a lot of like occasions, right? So they start investing, uh, investing this kind of like a AI augmented reality kind of translators. So which means your product, your land attribute is super important. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to match the language to the user or the content to the user, you know. So um, you can look at this is a video that created by Microsoft. So user can actually switch language and the sign language will actually change. So without that land attribute, you wouldn't understand and you wouldn't be able to identify that. Another thing is like a hyphenation that's important as well. If you don't put the uh, len, uh, like attribute in, you wouldn't know where to break it. So for the first example, you just break it like a regular English sentence. But in actually Portuguese, you have to break it. You have to find, hyphenate certain words. So those are the things that will um, like create issues for your layout as well. So be aware, uh, there are a lot of way more benefits that you can imagine for the len tag. An area, I'm not going to the, uh, like, uh, the detail to it. So there are a lot of tutorials online, and there's a uh, Google developers website and tell you all the details. And I was just want to focus on the, what area labels cannot do. So for example, it's the augment, it, it wouldn't be able to help you to create a lot of like, focus or events, you know, because and let, without like a JavaScript or without any other combination. So don't rely on it to say like uh, to, to have any kind of like actions or to try to use it to the non-natural way to fake a button or something. So don't use it as in that sense. Always use semantic HTML first and then use this uh, if there's no other choices that you have to, to mark it up this way. And another thing is that it's actually not SEO or not find content page on page friendly, which means any kind of area labels you put in behind the scene, it won't be fine by control of, uh, F, that kind of shortcuts. So be aware, it's not a place for you to actually hide the important stuff, right? So I, I saw a lot of people that put the password recommendation or like, uh, so for example, restriction, it has to be 12 characters, you have to be upper lower, numeric, and blah, blah, blah. A lot of people, for some reason, put that in area label instead of, like put in hint instead of visually show it. I don't understand why. Only visually impaired user will make that mistake? No, I don't think so, <laughs> right? So those are the things that uh, when you design is actually good for everyone, right? So the next portion I want to talk about like more of the inclusion. So people with like a, uh, physical disabilities versus like a things, now these are more like a inspirations that you think when you focusing on your product and your project, what are the things you have to consider. Earlier we touched on within 10 years, they will be 20% of seniors in the United States. You have to think about, right? So how does your product adapt to their lifestyle and their interaction to the product, right? So currently, they still use a lot of like they, we call tangible UX. So which means if it's a button, they make coffee, it has to look like a huge button next to the coffee machine. And they can actually press it, right? They are not used to say, make me a coffee, right? So those are the things that 
how do we transition from tangible UI to actually something that's uh, a suitable to their uh, lifestyle? And there's one thing that uh, one researcher I heard from other team as well is that uh, when they design those tangible UI, so for example, brew, uh, brew coffee, right? So, and here's a button, here's a UI, here's a, but the first question the senior usually ask is, is that machine washable? Right, so <laughs> their consideration is still bound to their physical world closely, right? So, which means how does your digital product have to adapt to actually be more immersive to the physical environment? So thinking that mindset, right? So if people, they are not used to touching something that's very augmented reality type of thing, right? And the next thing is that uh, think about like uh, nowadays, like a, a lot of information that are accessible in any kind of format or over the world, like in different kind of scenario or something. So you have to make sure the content can be delivered through any kind of medium. Another example is that, so for example, sometimes you pull up your device and where you, while you're waiting in line, while you're like taking the public transportation, right? So, which means the interruption can happen anytime, right? It might be oh, next number is you, you have to go up or oh, like uh, oh, you start talking to people next to you or something. So that kind of constant and stop interruption or so can something be recovered later on when they come back to the product, right? Will they be locked out? Will they be, can they still see the items in their shopping cart? And, and there are a lot of things that you have to consider for this kind of scenario. And the situational disabilities as well, right? So like people, they can regularly use their phone, their devices, but all of a sudden they have to use a can, the wheelchair. They are not used to interact with their product, with your product without both hands or if they have to mount it, mount the, the, uh, the devices on, the, on their wheelchairs or something, right? How will that experience happen? And how can you actually still give them the experience that they used to? And another one is that you have to consider, uh, like I said, like, uh, information is more accessible globally now. So which means the other side of the globe, somebody is probably accessing uh, your product as well, right? So they are probably on the different end of devices and they probably have different bandwidth of what you have right now. So is your product uh, bulletproof for low bandwidth, for low, low end devices, right? So what are the limitations and have you look at your analytic who's accessing your data and who's accessing your product and what's the smallest and the largest screen size. So you have probably need to get aware of, of those like use cases more and more now. And uh, another thing that we want to talk about is that uh, for inclusive inclusion, product inclusion. So for example, um, you probably see this kind of form all the time whenever you have to create an account, right? You probably never ask any questions but there's actually some issues here. So I'll just quickly show it. So why is title important? Right. If I want to uh, purchase grocery, if I want to purchase movie ticket, why does it matter you ask me on Miss or Mr. or whichever, right? So always asking, is it necessary? Or is this just for your organization's benefits? If there is no benefit to your user, kill it. You don't need it. Even your marketing team keep telling you, no, it's so important, we have to understand our marketing segment, blah, blah, blah. And you'll say, no, it's just one extra stuff that we don't need from our user, right? If you think of your user. And every one additional text field, you're actually seeing the dropping rate. Just keep going down, keep going down, right? So you don't want that happen. And uh, anyone watch this video in the past? No? This video was very popular last summer. So let me see if I can actually play it. It was posted on Twitter. And uh, the point is showing you if a product is designed without thinking the inclusive uh, inclusion of their product. Let me go back and then click on this one. Sorry. 
Ok, dove è? Mi c'è. Anzi, vai. Tu black o tu black? Eh? Tu black o tu black? Tu black o tu black? Tu black o tu black? <laughs> okay, I mean they are laughing, they are very generous, you know. <laughs> I think for a lot of scenarios people flipped already, right? So, yeah, so basically what, ha what just happened is that it doesn't recognize the dark skin tone. So which is very, very sad, right? And then why would you, why would you do the product like this, right? So it just like blow people's mind. So that's why it was very popular. You can find it on Twitter. And uh, we are at the top of our time, I'll just quickly go through. So uh, I want to like keep re quickly remind you the open set concept, uh, open source data set concept, you know. So there are actually over 9 million images that's on GitHub nowadays. And it was used to a lot of company for their machine learning data set. But the fact is, there's only one, less than 1% was actually the image donated from Africa. So what does that mean? And what, how does that impact our life? So basically, if you go to any kind of search engine, you search for African costume, this is what happened. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> this is an African costume. So it's actually not funny, right? So which means we are actually misinterpreting a lot of things in our daily life that without our own awareness. And there's another study that was done by Facebook. So they was actually showing the, uh, the image recognition technology they have. So you can say, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with machine learning or not, ground truth, which means the, the correct answer for the object, right? And there are different artificial intelligence down below tell you what they think that image is. So take the first one, for example. It is uh, the soap from Nepal. And, uh, and different artificial intelligence was thinking, most of them think it's food. Why is that? Because they never experienced the soap that was put in the kitchen next to the toothbrush, next to their dishes, next to blah, blah, blah. So the artificial intelligence doesn't know there's such setup existing in the other side of the world. And it actually shows the economic status, right? Because a lot of like a household in certain like underdeveloped country, they don't have separate kitchen. They use their bathroom for everything, wash their dishes, wash their clothes and everything, right? So, but the machine learning or the open data set never captured that kind of scenario. So which means there's actually won't be a good training model for that. So that's something that we're lacking nowadays. So just be aware, okay, machine learning can be super good, but on the other end, unless we have the good data set. And so there's a lot of things that, um, no, no, no such thing as edge cases, just like you said, uh, we said earlier. And just make sure we test things over and over again and make sure we focus on the user's mindset over what we think their marketing segment is and ad adapting to the limitations, such as the screen reader, internet speed, and their device, um, like which, which kind of like, uh, technology they're using. And another one is that make sure we pay attention to the machine learning fairness. So for example, their ages, their abilities, their environment, and who wasn't represented in the data set or in your, um, the, the, the database that you already accept. And then what does fair mean to your product? And how does this application, application will be shown fairly to others? So just keep thinking those kind of things, right? So it's not just shipping the product, but are you doing anything that's biasedly, like unconsciously biased? All right, so this is overwhelmed. Just want to make sure you are not alone and roll your entire team in, get as much training as possible and make sure your statement, make sure your PN and everybody is on board. And yeah, this is what we covered today, uh, language, social status, races, regions, disability, gender, age, situation. I don't think, if you want to stick around and ask questions, I can ask answer your questions. Sorry, went over. All right, thank you. <laughs>